So in anticipation of FASD Awareness Day 2019, which is really the 20 year anniversary, um, we have Brian Philcox here from FAS World Canada, FAS World Canada, mm -hmm. actually FAS World International. Of course. And in uh, September of 1999, you and Bonnie, your wife, Bonnie Buxton, came up with the idea of FASD Awareness Day. And what prompted you to do that? Well, it's pretty simple. Bonnie's a writer. My background is marketing communication. And what we realized, because we'd been into the FAS, FAE at the time situation, <clears throat> and we thought, there are too many politicians, too many professionals, too many parents, too much of the public, the media. They didn't really know about this. They didn't understand it. And we thought, we've got to do something to create much broader awareness. <clears throat> so I remember being in our kitchen, in our house in the beach in Toronto, and we had cartons packed. We were moving, we were selling our house, we were moving and it was in the middle of a snowstorm in Toronto winter. And really frustrated with all the problems with the move and so on and saying, you know, what can we do this year about creating some more awareness? And, and then suddenly it came to me, you know, this is 1999. In September, what if, what if, what if on the first minute of the first hour, no, I'll correct myself, on the ninth minute of the ninth hour, of the ninth day, of the ninth month of 1999, we do something, we do anything, we create an event just to let people know that during the nine months of the pregnancy, a woman should avoid alcohol. Well, our good friend, we, we thought about this and we thought, okay, that's that's good. We can build on that. We called our friend Teresa Kellerman in Arizona and uh, all the way to Tucson. And, and she said, that's a great idea. And she did. She's great with graphics and great with putting things together on the computer. So we came up with this and because the internet was just starting to roll, and what we did was we talked to as many people as we could on the internet about this idea. And you know what? Communities all over the United States, all over Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, South Africa, and, and, and more places than I can really name. And what they did is they, they did things on the, in their churches, in the basements, on the steps of city halls, in, in meeting places, in, in their living rooms. And they just did all kinds of stuff. And, and we compiled all of this, but it was absolutely amazing. And everybody said, what a terrific idea this is, and we're gonna do it again. So as of this year, over 62 countries in every time zone around the world now observe in their own way, FAS Day, which is absolutely marvelous. And I think it's terrific that people picked up on it and did it, but I, I'm i still very disappointed. Mm, tell me about that. Yeah, because we've had a <clears throat> chance to talk well, here's, a little bit. Well, here's why I'm disappointed. After all these years, I mean, this year will be the 21st actual FAS Day. Mm. I know it's the 20th anniversary, but it'll be the actual 21st event that's happening. And we're doing it in Toronto, and they're doing it in other places all around the world also. But what is frustrating is that the awareness level has only increased a little bit. Mm -hmm. And yet the research that we've had coming out, <clears throat> coming out of the United States and out of Canada is telling us, oh, the prevalence is not 1% that we thought all along, it's more like 4%. It may be higher in some communities, I know in, in South Africa and in Russia and so on, it's much, much higher. But still, in Canada and the US, 
on an average, about 4%. Look, 1% is already an enormous number. It's bigger than any anything, whether you talk about SARS or Zika virus or opioids or anything else. It's bigger than all of those things at 1%. Now, 4% is a pandemic. I think that's totally nuts that we're not dealing with that in a very definite and programmed kind of way. But our politicians and the media just seem to discount it because they think, well, drinking is normal, isn't it? So what are we going to do about it? Well, I mean, Brian, do you really think that it's only that they think um, that drinking <clears throat> is normal? Or do you think that, and, you know, you may or may not want to say this, but that the influence of big alcohol has something to do with that perception or misperception because you know we we do know that this is a public health crisis we do know that if it were equivalent to let's say a communicable illness communicable disease that meaning it's transmitted by a vector like a you know like zika virus for sure. instance yeah. or it's um caused by a drug like thalidomide right if if it were on that level um the public health community would be responding differently so we have to ask ourselves is it a much deeper issue than just um hey this is a problem we need to solve it we've solved bigger problems we've solved polio mm. yeah we've solved uh tuberculosis We've solved um, many of the major malformations that we know what caused them. Most of the communicable diseases, Almost except, except now measles is coming back because we've got people who have been misled into believing that the vaccines can cause harm instead of protecting people from the things like measles that, that can be caused. Yeah, and, so, and that's a benefit to risk ratio that yeah. we take on as public health people. We say, okay, the benefits to the society outweigh the risk, harm, or detriment to the individual. Therefore, we believe that vaccines are helpful. And well, so helpful to the point where it's, if there is any aberrant behavior or, or a result sort of thing. It is so minuscule, it is it is not even worth considering. And there is virtually no proof that I know of right. that any of these vaccines do cause what some people claim that they're. So people who aren't vac vaccinated, they're carriers, right. you know, and, right. That's, right. and that's why we have this problem now with things like measles coming back, which is very dangerous. Right. So. But, so this isn't measles. This is not communicable. You cannot transmit it by a um, insect. It's not, you know, transmitted that way. It's not transmitted by drinking water that is contaminated with bacteria or it coughing. It is transmitted by commerce. By commerce. It by is, marketing. It, yes, exactly. And and the thing is, it is such a large business the alcohol beverage alcohol business is a very large business 220 billion a year yeah. at the last time i calculated and in this you know, country this, and you've heard me speak of this before but the thing is we look at we look at alcohol which when not even when it's being abused but at any time alcohol is a teratogen right which means it can alter what is developing in the womb, the, <laughs> the, the fetus is so vulnerable at this time. And during those, those first few weeks, that's when, the, that's when the limbs and organs, their cellular structures are being formed. That, that can be very severe. But throughout the entire nine, nine months, that's when the whole brain is being formed. And don't forget, the brain continues to be formed. Um, throughout the lifetime of the individual. So so this is an ongoing process. The brain is very plastic and it really needs to be nurtured as well as it possibly can be. But if we don't plan for a pregnancy, and of course, when I talk to high school kids, you know, I say, what what do you think planning for a pregnancy is? And they, they look at me rather shyly and say, well, well, it's when the man and the woman have 
a talk. They think they would like to have a baby and so on. I said, sure, that's that's part of the planning process. You discuss it, sure. But don't forget, if you're sexually active and not using contraception, you're planning a pregnancy. And I get a lot of eye rolling and a lot of people saying, I never thought of it like that. I said, well, start because that's when you avoid alcohol because if you're sexually active and not using contraception, that's when you have to avoid the alcohol because it, you don't know when you're going to be pregnant. You don't know when that pregnancy starts. So if you're drinking socially, casually, whatever way you're drinking, you can be doing severe damage to from the, from the zygote to the to the fetus to the time the baby's born. I mean, even after, I mean, if, if you're breastfeeding, you know, I'd say continue to avoid the alcohol. I know it's hard if you if you're a drinker, if you even if you call yourself a social drinker, you always have the cravings and it's very difficult. So that's where the partner is really important. And whoever your partner is, that's that's where you need that moral support to to keep away from from the booze. Yeah. during this critical time. I, you know, I often tell people, even just adults who drink, um, who have secondary consequences like not sleeping well and having problems like that, I say, well, try going without alcohol for three months. And really the three months period is a preconceptional period, we yeah. say. If you're planning a pregnancy, you need to start three months before pregnancy. And for men, it takes three months for sperm to develop. So you want your sperm to be healthy, you want to be on a vitamin, mm -hmm. you want to be getting good rest and all that. But for people who have any secondary consequences of alcohol, just adults, I say try it for three months, not having any. And if you can't go without it for three months, you may have a problem. I'm not saying you do 